Are you, are you baiting me right now? I'm trying to bait you right now. Yeah. Tattoos are becoming more popular in Israel. <laughs> like bring in all the abnormals and the freaks and just have like these great events because uh, you definitely had a knack for it. And you kind of have that persona, man. Nine. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two. And recording. I am Chris Collins. I'm Russ Abbott. And this is the other side of the tattoo. That sound official? Yeah, that was great. You like that? No, I actually haven't heard any episodes of the other side of the tattoo yet. So yeah, because none are I don't out. Know what's going to happen? I uh, have no idea. There really isn't a show. I'm just getting people to uh, speak to me on camera while I don't wear pants. Oh, okay, good. This is, this is a fact. I didn't wear pants either. Well, I do that to regulate my temperature in my house because if i sit here in pants and then i'm sweaty then that's not going to be good so if i do it in no pants and you can't tell i'm good to go yeah that's how that's how i play it that's how i roll so i didn't i forgot to mention when we talked about travel earlier my trip to israel oh yeah i saw a little bit about that no nothing about it so now you have to tell me about that okay yeah okay so i was invited for the second year of healing inc that's put on by a charity group called artists for Israel. And uh, what's um, the website for that? Um, probably if there is a website. It's probably um, artist, the number four Israel, something like that. Um, and you, can yeah. you know, Craig, the, uh, the founder and, and uh, promoter, and leader of the organizer of the event, the charity is uh, artist for Israel on Instagram, I believe. And, um, it, it was incredible, man. I was there with uh, nine other tattooers and we tattooed people who had been victims of conflict in Israel. Um, the, uh, the two people I tattooed, one was um, present when a, uh, a nightclub was attacked by a suicide bomber. She lost a couple of her friends that day. She was, uh, you know, kind of injured in, in a whole lot of ways and, and spent years with PTSD, not really being able to leave her house. So it was really cool to meet her. And she's kind of, I mean, she's, she's healing from the PTSD and, you know, getting tattooed as part of this was, uh, you know, we actually did the tattoo at Mike's place where the bombing happened. No way. Right there. Um, you know, a bar right there on the beach in Tel Aviv and, um, all of us tattooed on like, pretty much the outdoor patio of this bar and restaurant with, you know, right across the street from the beach, beautiful day, beautiful location. The other day we tattooed, um, in the Israel museum, which is like the main museum in Israel. I, I tattooed in a room, a giant room filled with these like sculptures of trees by an artist named, uh, Ai Weiwei, a Chinese artist named Ai Weiwei. Um, but man, it was incredible experience. I mean, two days of tattooing five or six days of, um, just being taken around with this amazing group of people and seeing all the, you know, important, most interesting parts of, uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Wow. Unbelievable. Intense. And that was the, mo uh, tell a little bit more about the, uh, the purpose of it. I obviously you tattooed somebody that was in this attack. So this sounds right. like it was a, a therapeutic tattoo session where you're tattooing victims to help them, you know, with just like you would do a double mastectomy, like where you're trying to help right. grow from the experience, beautify something right. that may have been damaged, et cetera, et cetera, or just tell the story. Yeah. I mean, you hit it on the head. I mean, in some cases, I think the, the people that applied to be tattooed, um, you know, just wanted to, to do something, you know, to take control of, yeah. of their lives and what, you know, like when you decide to get tattooed, you're taking power, you know, you're taking control of, of your body. Yeah. Um, in these people's cases, they, you know, something was done to them. Something really terrible happened to them that they have absolutely no control of. So, you know, um, tattoos are becoming more popular in Israel. There, you know, there were some tattooers that we met from Tel Aviv that were really great. Um, wonderful people, great artists. There's, you know, a kind of a, an evolving scene for tattooing in Israel. Um, I think a lot of people thought, you know, Oh, I, I heard that Jewish people don't even get tattoos because there's this whole thing of, 
you know, not being able to be buried in a Jewish right. cemetery or something like that. And I learned that that's pretty much just a myth that, you know, Jewish grandmothers and parents tell the kids, you know, just to keep them from getting tattooed. So sure. Yeah. Scare them out of it. Right. Like exactly. you'll never, you'll never get a job. Yeah. I mean, the really, you know, what the, the what do they call them? Um, the uh, Orthodox, you know, the really, really religious Jews wouldn't get tattooed anyway, but you sure. know, most of the people that, or there in the country are, are more moderate and um, you know, they would, they would potentially get a tattoo. So in a way I felt like we were, you know, ambassadors for tattooing, you know, we were like, you know, it was, it was, a, um, there was media that talked about our, our project, you know, there were a whole lot of articles and, you know, stories on the, on the television and then the newspapers all over. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good thing, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it was just interesting, man. I've never been a part of any um, any kind of trip like that, or I, you know, I haven't haven't really tattooed for charity before. But I would definitely, you know, look for opportunities to do that again. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is that kind of like open up that idea for you about like, hey, man, maybe this is something I can get down on, not on the business level, but just on the uh, the beneficial side, the humanita- humanitarian side. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're looking for more ways to, uh, to do that, you know, talking about it as ink and dagger, you know, as a, as a shop and, and trying to, uh, come up with some plans to do something, you know, that kind of, uh, would be a follow up to that, you know, had some really cool opportunities this year. Um, got to go on a family vacation with my wife and my oldest son to, uh, Paris and London. That's pretty awesome. So, that was amazing. Um, it's been a couple of weeks there. We even went to the Paris Disneyland. How was that? Uh, it wasn't that good, man. No, it can't be good. No. <laughs> no. Like, they're not good. None of the other ones are good. I'm from Orlando, and it's not just because I'm from there, but it's the <laughs> best one for yeah. reason. And yeah. The, yeah. It was, it was weird. I, there was a uh, Tex-Mex restaurant. And uh, I had the good fortune to meet my friend Boris Bianchi, who happened to be traveling through there at the same time. Very cool. And um, Boris and I shared a drink at a Tex-Mex restaurant just outside of Paris, London. And I ordered chips and salsa because that's what you do at at a Mexican restaurant. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, (laughs) he ended up bringing me chips, which were like chips. And then he brought me packets of hot sauce like you would get at Taco Bell. And now I understand why you looked at me so weird. <laughs> so, uh, Did you stay outside of Paris, London? Uh, Paris, I believe, is in France, right? Did I say London? You did. I did go to London. Oh, there you go. You're just mashing it all together. Yeah. I do know that Paris is outside France. Or is France. <laughs> the Disneyland Paris is outside France. Uh, right. London, man, uh, aside from having like an amazing show and other stuff, and it, it, obviously it's a really good time. I was really bummed. I'm not going to lie. Sorry for everybody listening. Just because it was no, it wasn't culture shock enough. I felt right. like if I'm leaving the country, like I want to get, you know, I want to get like totally slammed with a different perspective, like go sure. to Bolivia and, you know, I eat llama. Like right. that's, that's the type <laughs> of shit I want to do there. Not just get like more French fries. <laughs> so, and I went when the, 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 the price point was really far off. It was like two and a quarter to the dollar. So like oh, okay. every time I ate lunch, it was like, like 22 bucks for a sandwich. So it was, Whoa. yeah, it was a little rough. It was a little rough, but I want to <laughs> go back uh, without an agenda. When I went, I was way too busy. Like I just, I didn't have any, any fun to do anything else. I mean, I did a little bit of sightseeing, but we were mostly just there. It was like bang, bang, bang and out. So when did you go to London? I went uh, years ago at the beginning of um, Steadfast when we were doing the trade show circuit and we went out there to London Edge and uh, we did that. So I went out there and I, I hung out with mostly uh, uh, clothing industry people. So okay. it was really cool. They took us out and it was really fun. Um, we had a blast. But like I said, it's, you know, you and I have talked about that before, like the whole traveling everywhere. Oh, look, I, I showed one of your tattoos. Oh, look at <laughs> it. Is. I can't ever get a weird yeah, what are you terrible doing? at showing my tattoos. But, um, but uh, we talked about that too. One of the one of the craziest things that people do in this industry is just claim they've traveled but never actually go anywhere. So they like fly into places on Fridays and fly out on Sundays and claim that they've been to somewhere. But you've yeah. you've been to an airport and you've been to another Hyatt. 
or a Sheridan. Like you haven't, you haven't gotten it starts to feel after a while. Oh, it does. And like some people live on that pattern and other people. And I try to take that example, uh, spend a lot more time, at least a couple of extra days, especially if you fly across the ocean, stay a week, figure it out. Like what's the point? I always try to add some extra days. And if it's a tattoo convention, I, you know, I get there on Thursday and try to leave on Wednesday or something. If it's someplace I haven't been before. Absolutely. You know, so the show is Friday through Sunday and then you've got two more days really see the place. Yep. What's your next ones? I mean, are you coming up to Philly area anytime soon? No, I don't think I am. Well, fuck you. Yeah. yeah my next one is um, at the end of January, I'm going to Golden State. Yep. We'll be there. Yeah. The, uh, Pasadena convention. And there's a, uh, a one day, all day super seminar thing that I'm a part of called Black Acre Academy. Sounds way too technical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they asked me to talk about digital design, so oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak on that for a little under an hour, and um, then I'm just going to sit through classes from eight or nine other tattooers that I really nice. look up to. So, very good, pretty sweet deal for me. Nice, and you're not going to talk about that subject. We're not going to talk about. Um, interesting thing you bring up, the exactly what you just said that you're going there to talk about digital digital arts and mm -hmm. how that uh, transfers over to tattooing. One of the things that's um, and interesting about you is that you, your style, whether it's the shop and a lot of the, uh, the reference that you use and a lot of the application you use is very old world, right? Mm -hmm. But you are arguably one of the most on the cutting edge of technology and application into art and into tattooing. And people that right. know you uh, know that. And if not, um, give a shout out to some of your sites and projects. I mean, hell, you might as well use this to advertise, right? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, most notably, I'm the founder of Tattoo Smart, and Tattoo Smart is a site that is um, essentially a marketplace for tattooers like myself who make digital designs, or not really designs, but um, things like brushes that you can use in programs on the iPad and the computer that will assist you in, uh, in drawing certain things more quickly. Um, lots of great layout tools. Um, you know, I have the Avid color wheel on there. So, um, digital palettes, we have all these different colors from different ink brands that have been digitized. So you can design tattoos with the exact colors of the, uh, the tattoo ink. So it's just a, a way to, uh, sort of locate all of the, the best resources that we've been able to compile so far for tattooers who are into digital design. And what I find most interesting about that, you know, me, like when I think about it as a business stance, like I, there's no question. I owned a shop for 10 years, like anything that the artist could have done to cut down on the preparation time to get the final result and have a happy client and maximize their efforts. I mean, that's just, that should, it's basic. Like I'm like, of course, but then I've got like, you know, super old school friends that are like, no, you had to draw everything on wood with a hammer. You know what I mean? They just really hold on to certain traditions, but you right. transcend both of that like massively because a lot of your reference material, you're kind of like the Jules Verne of tattooing, right? It's like, <laughs> like old modern, you know, like you're bringing in this technology, but it's got this feel to it. It's got, you hate to say steampunk, um, but like, yeah. you know, literary surrealism and shit that he was known for. It's kind of like how you approach it, right? So how, how does that, how has that transpired? Has there been a lot of contrast with that? Has a lot of, uh, been a lot of conflict with any artists with that approach or has it been more widely received in a positive? I think it's all positive. I mean, of course there's going to be people out there who, um, you know, make comments about how digital art has no soul. Um, you know, I agree with them. <laughs> you know, the uh, designs that I'm making for my tattoos are designs that I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out as much as I can about what the tattoo is going to look like before I start. And for me, the tattoo has the soul. Right. The design is, um, you know, if, if I can avoid laboring over certain parts, that there's a, a great piece of technology or a tool that makes it more possible, then I'm going to use it. So it's, it's not, um, I mean, the, the really only downside to the way I'm doing things is that I don't have a drawer somewhere full of scraps of tracing paper that I can, you know, kind of, uh, 
dig through when I'm 80 years old and, and look back on all the memories, you know? No, you have to look at it on a flash drive. Right, exactly. If it still works. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, Same if, if it still works. But, yeah, you know, it's... People, people won't be able to auction off your shit when you die as easily. That's correct. Yeah, I'm not really going to leave a, a legacy. But, you know, I, I really wonder if there's ever going to be a market for for that kind of stuff anyway. You know, maybe there will. I don't... I know where you're coming from with it. I think that, I think that nostalgic items like that are more valuable when there's less of them. If, yeah. every, if everybody right now, I mean the, the, the sheer amount of artists that are good, <laughs> even just good to great compared to, you know, 20 years ago is just, it's too large of a catalog. I mean, how many, how many stencils could you possibly collect? It kind of has right. to be from those originators. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Like Henry Ford is always going to be Henry Ford. You know, it's going to have mm -hmm. a different feel to it than the people that are working at Honda right now. That you have For no sure. idea there. For sure. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. And it carries over into different ways. I mean, as everything becomes more digital and electronically based anyways, the legacies are going to be embedded in the programming and in the stuff that you're creating now. I mean, you know, tech heads know every, every <clears throat> gamer and every designer and everybody that was relevant in their field. So it'll just carry over. Right. Besides, you can't carry uh, acetates on your phone. And <laughs> that's pretty much the only way anybody's going to do it anyways. Right. So, no, that's always been cool, man. Because, like, the style, like, you could, I could see you at your shop with the way your shop looks. Give a shout out to your shop, man. Ink and Dagger Tattoo, Roswell, Georgia. God, you're terrible. And uh, for everybody who doesn't know what a Roswell is in Georgia, just say Atlanta. Just yeah, Atlanta it's area. just north of Atlanta. Yeah. Get into Atlanta, look it up, uh, go there. I've been tattooed by Russ. The shop's amazing. But you could totally get, you could totally see that shop being one where everybody's in the back still making ink, right? You could <laughs> totally get that vibe there. But then, yeah, in some ways, but then, you know, there's no one drawing on paper hardly anymore. Right. We've we got two drawing rooms with um, a total of probably six light tables in the shop, and they've just become places to, uh, to sit your computer and your you know iPod on I, iPad on top of. Um. <laughs> I don't even think I've been to the new shop. No, well, you should. That's terrible. Yeah. What, How long has the new one been there? Uh, three years. Yeah, that's I'm a bad three friend. And the expansion was um, earlier this year, so there's even more ink and dagger to uh, that you haven't seen. There's so much ink and dagger. <laughs> Any future plans of, uh, and I know you get asked this way too often, but I'm going to do it anyways because we had a lot of fun at it. Any like man day ideas, maybe a 10 year anniversary man day party? Well, we did just have a 10 year anniversary party. It but wasn't man, man day. day. No. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm not ruling it out. Yeah. I'm ruling it out. But it might just go down as like a great time in history. Yeah. Well, I hope that it already has, but we did it for three years running and, yeah. and then, um, I guess it was about six or seven years ago um, when my wife was pregnant with our third child and I was just too overwhelmed at that point to plan a man day. So it didn't happen that year and then it just didn't feel right to ever bring it back again. So right. it was now it's dead. I think that you're would have been better suited as like a, like a circus ringleader. <laughs> like I always thought that that was yeah. kind of more, you're more of like the podium kind of like presenter. <laughs> like bring in all the abnormals and the freaks and just have like these great events because uh you definitely had a knack for it and you kind of have that persona man i can see you in the whole getup. i think that's next year's uh yeah next year's halloween costume okay i'll start working on it <laughs> um so you were telling me the other day uh you were having a struggle with a shutter situation <laughs> and I wanted to know if that has been resolved yet because I think I called no. you right in the middle of you figuring out that yeah. your shutters, which you so like adamantly expressed needed to be functional shutters to close, not for any real purpose, but that you expected this to happen. It did not. <laughs> well, let me tell you what happened. So we had this big storm. Um, it was just kind of the tail end of, um, what was that hurricane that came through? Just uh, shit. I don't even remember. Irma? Could be. Was it Irma? Okay, so so Irma, you know, the, the end of Irma basically ended up being a really crazy storm here in Georgia. And it blew one of those plastic shutters off of my house. Okay. And it took that plastic shutter and I it went all the way across the street. Like I found it hundreds and hundreds of feet from where it must have started. And um, it was just plastic. I had no idea because I'd never really 
examine the uh, shitty fake shutters that were on my house. Um, <laughs> Took them and, for uh, then I found out, yeah, I thought that they were at least made of a solid material, but they were just like a form of the front of the, sh- you know, the shape of a shutter made of plastic. And, um, and to me, like no purpose, fake shutters are just the, the perfect symbol for everything that's wrong with the United States. You know, also. because at some point, I don't know when it was exactly, maybe it was the 1960s or the 1970s, all the people building homes just said, you know what, we don't really use these shutters that much. Let's forget about making them even work. Like, let's just fucking attach them directly to the house. Got it. And then from there, they were like, okay, well, now that we're attaching them directly to the house and they don't work, you know there were multiple phases of them getting shittier and shittier until they finally got around to let's just mold them out of plastic and it'll just look like a shutter from the front. And and when you like even think about those shutters covering the window, if you fold them in, they wouldn't even cover the whole window anymore. Like everyone forgot that they were supposed to even cover the window. So when you go around looking at houses, at least around here where I live, they've all got these fake shutters. They wouldn't cover the window if you shut them. And and that's my house. So, um, you know, and I've, I've put a lot of energy into making this house a really nice place to live. But the fact is, fake shutters. <laughs> so, so the resolution um, to that? Uh, move, I guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go to a better country. Right. Yeah. I, so I called, Proper I asked my wife to, um, you know, help us find a really good shutter company. And I wanted to not only replace the missing shutter, but replace all the shutters on the house and get them up to the standard that, you know, I think they should be at working. And the shutter guy from the best shutter company around comes out and he basically just looks at me like I'm an idiot for asking for shutters that work. He's like, why would you want to do that? Like you have air conditioning, you're never going to use them. No one uses them. I was like, then why have them? Yeah, why have them? Because they they serve some purpose, you know? They're like they're eyebrows picket, for windows, you know? They Picket fence, that, that feeling. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just to wrap things up, I ended up paying several thousand dollars to put more fake shutters on my house, but I have nicer fake shutters <laughs> with hinges that appear to close and probably would close if I were to unscrew the uh, the claps that hold the shutters to the house. Now, do they actually close? Would they, they do, reach? They, they do close, but the problem is we had two windows on our house that are double wide windows. Sure. And so you, you really shouldn't put shutters on windows like that because no, you should have double hip have, shutters. And you, they that's what you have to do. Yeah. yeah, and then they extend yeah. out and go. Yeah, so you have two shutters crammed together that are sticking out from your house a long way, and it looks like shit too. So ultimately, man, I. I just went with the uh, nicer fake shutters than what I had before. They're so actually you're, you're, you're compensated. Solid. You met middle ground. You're okay. I'm not okay, but every time you come home, you look at me. I was hoping to not talk about it anymore because it really gets me upset, man. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You told me I couldn't talk about the forbidden thing, the, <laughs> the thing that shall not be named. So right. you have to deal with shutters. Okay, fine. All right. So that's that. <laughs> what other subjects do you get worked up about? Oh my God, it's so easy. We can just pick some things <laughs> apart. Political climate, talk about God, talk about all of those things. The misappropriation of giving uh, every accomplishment that somebody worked very, very hard for uh, over to God. Somebody comes out of heart surgery and everybody, the whole family's rejoicing. The doctor says, I saved your 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 dad and then you come out and you go thank god and the poor doctor is sitting there like what are you talking about i'm an atheist <laughs> why are you giving me over this props it's not fair yeah yeah <laughs> are, you, are you baiting me right now i am i'm trying to bait you right now yeah everybody wants to hear that subject no they don't oh god yes they do. no they you don't know the they good don't. Thing they... is? Nobody watch. Nobody's listening. That's the best part about it. It's just us <laughs> ranting. So that's where it all becomes a uh, super uh, freeform. Because <laughs> nobody's ever going to listen to it. Like nobody's ever going to be like, right, oh, yeah, here, Russ Abbott right. talk about his shutters. <laughs> listen to Chris fucking talk in the corner of his house. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, man. Sorry. That's not okay. falling for it. You're not falling for it. No, Damn it. No. <laughs> I hate this guy. He's a rock. So what about the music game, man? Uh, last, uh, I really caught up with you. You were playing some public events. You had started singing. I saw you sing in uh, Carolina at the show. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty that much That your first the... time performing, correct? Uh, Not my first time performing, but definitely my first time performing in front of, you know, like a tattoo crowd. Right. Singing in front of the tattoo. You played before, but yeah. not ever took yeah. over the mic. That was actually my first time hearing you live take over the mic. <laughs> it was pretty well, good, man. Fortunately, um, well, thank you. Um, yeah, that was, it was scary. It was more like just, um, for me, it was just kind of checking a box in a way, you know, yeah. just, I, I don't really intend to, uh, try to make anyone else listen to me yeah. playing an instrument or singing or anything like that. Um, it's, it's something that I like to do on my own, you know, um, What's that crossover though friends, between but, public, but between public speaking in front of the same types of crowd with information, um, where does that, where do you think that breakdown happens where it's like, okay, but performing the music, uh, which actually might reach a broader group of that same right. and more of them could comprehend it. Maybe I'm I'm terrified of public speaking too, yep. so it's no no different. But um, as we all are, you know, I I think that at least when I'm speaking to tattooers about something that I actually know about, um, I can have a little bit more confidence that they're there to hear me do that, you know. And it's um, yeah, people that came to hear good music and and my ass shows up and gets in front of the mic. It, um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's actually good. And I think you know that because you know how to follow it up with anything and actually do it competently. I mean, you you don't just like to do it. You don't do, I don't think you do anything just from gut instinct. I'm pretty sure you went and like downloaded every fucking <laughs> bit of information there was on singing and performing in public to make it work. And we all know that there are people in our industry, we'll keep their names out of it, just like the thing that shall not be spoken, uh, that get up and play at the events. And it's definitely just for fun. And right quality of maybe like you know japanese karaoke but it's still fun <laughs> and we still like right. it so we yeah. all cheer them on sure <laughs> but yeah. there's no like misgivings that those <laughs> drunken people are actually sounding good at any particular time right right <laughs> no that's <laughs> it's like nascar you're there to see a wreck exactly exactly yeah. with a few exceptions there's a few talented folks in there but for sure for the most part but you haven't pursued it any more locally. I'm like uh, just hitting the circuit there or anything. The um, the Mexican restaurant circuit is about That's as far as at? I plan to take it, man. But I, no, I haven't actually done that. I don't have like a, a full repertoire yet of, of songs that I could sing. You know, I couldn't sit down and play 10 songs in a row or anything like that. Not yet. Maybe I have like two or three I could do. Do you like writing your own or do you like performing others? I'm not really trying to write my own, man. I, I don't really, uh, I don't really have that skill. So it's more about just playing covers. That's cool. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's for fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's something to do to relax and um, get my mind off the the constant thought of, of tattooing and, and business ownership and all that, you know, it's right. just, you know, a typical day for me here at the house when it's a work day from home, um, like today is, um, will be like, one or two hours in front of the computer, answering emails, making things for Tattoo Smart, and then like 20 minutes of messing around on a banjo, you know? There you go. To release. And I have been in that basement. Oh, there's your deer painting. I see it there. But I have been yeah. in that, I've been in the basement and uh, seen the collection. Have you added any new instruments to that, uh, that portfolio? They're all here in this music room upstairs now, man. It's uh, upstairs now? Yeah, yeah. What happened to the basement scene? Um, well, the, the basement's still down there, um, but yeah, the, I didn't think you filled the it in instruments anything. have moved up here. <laughs> we have this, I'll give you a quick tour and uh, forgive the piles of mess here. But, Let's do it. Um, I, don't, I know most people are just listening to this, but so there's... Yeah, you can explain it. There's a banjo over there. I don't know what you see right now. Piano, banjo, front door. There's a banjo and then more banjo, guitar. I don't know what you see right now. There's uh, three guitars in the corner. That black one over there is a, um, a dobro. I like to mess around with that. And then there's a ukulele, which I'm trying to say it more Hawaiian since we have Kiyoki at the shop and he actually plays the ukulele. <laughs> um, and then I have that thing that's real pretty, but sounds like shit. 
<laughs> There's the, uh, another acoustic guitar. So one of the things that happens here at the Abbott House, if you come to visit me, is that no matter what your skill level with music is, I will um, put an instrument in your hands. You are forced. Yeah, yeah, I will put an instrument in your hands and um, show you like one or two things that you're allowed to do on it. Yeah, and then um, I remember that we'll I had like the, a uh, three-string yeah. cigar. Right. Yeah, we had cigar box me. guitars. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That thing was awesome. I've been thinking about um, trying to have some kind of open jam night things at the shop lately, man. That'd um, be awesome. I think uh, I think I'm gonna do it. I think it's gonna give us an opportunity to to put some more people together. You know, tattooers, non-tattooers, customers, um, just kind of like have a little uh, social time at the shop. I dig it. I could see uh, I could see down the road with some sort of business like that. You ever thought about the restaurant bar business as something completely side? I know you've done some stuff with a barbecue joint there in Atlanta. Yeah, we have Lincoln Dagger. Dagger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, are you affiliated with that just in name or like actual participation? Um, I'm. I mean, we're essentially the sponsors of a barbecue team, and I um I handle. You heard that right, guys. He is yeah. the sponsors of a barbecue team. Right. Which so amazing. And it's called Oink and Dagger, which is Ink and Dagger, like my tattoo shop with an O in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and so how exactly did, does that work? How does a barbecue team work? I'm not familiar. I knew that there were barbecue competitions, but I had no right, idea. Yeah. Teams. Well, I mean, I, Oink and Dagger doesn't go out and compete as much as I, I wish that Oink and Dagger would. Um, you know, it's, it's, one guy, this guy named Johnny, and he, um, you know, he's been really cool about coming to our events and making barbecue for us as Lincoln Dagger. And, you know, but he, he's not like really like steadily out there, like trying to win some titles or anything like that. So it even knows a thing, man. I've always pictured yeah. it as like a local get together, but no, like there's actually a full circuit for this, just like I'm sure yeah. there's a full circuit for everything. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, so we made some t shirts and, I believe there's some stickers out there. Um, if I, when I was wearing the Oink and Dagger t-shirt out, people would um, always stop me and want to talk about barbecue. And I learned that, you know, I really don't know much about barbecue. So <laughs> it was like I'm eating it. I mean, I that's like, all that really yeah, matters. Exactly. Yeah. It's delicious. Well, oh, that would be, I could see that, man. I could see that as a, a secondary thing, like a barbecue joint with open mic, kind of like uh, <laughs> a jam and eat sort of setup. Man, there's a lot that, um, I could put my time into, you know, if you had it, there's, yeah, there's always ideas. It's just a matter of like deciding which ones to, to put energy into, you know, and I got these kids and these kids yeah. want to go have these lives and they need all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They're not just little anymore. <laughs> you can't just like lock them in closets and all of that. They're... No, not locking them in closets anymore. <laughs> what are the kids into these days, man? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. So, so Jonah is, you know, still way into computers, man. Like he's 12 now and, you know, he got really into Minecraft for a while. Um, and I haven't seen him messing with that too much lately, but it, it's been more about just like hours and hours of watching YouTube videos about like every subject you could possibly imagine, man. He's just like a sponge trying to soak it all up. That's awesome. Um, so he's like getting into politics. <laughs> really you know, religion he's trying to learn about all the different religions and uh um you know he's he's into travel like that's got to be an uh, interesting uh, journey with him talking to you about i'm gonna try and bait you again that's oh, got to be yeah. interesting for him uh coming at you with religion especially if he's not doing it like a fundamentalist he's looking to get the overview yeah i mean i i'd like to think that he's just interested from a like a, a purely uh like human perspective, like he just wants to understand the world that he's living in. But there's a part of me that knows that I, you know, he's going to he, be an evangelist. <laughs> he's 12. Right. Yeah, right. So I think that, um, you know, he goes to school with a lot of kids who are, you know, straight up like Baptist and Methodist mostly, you know, so like, coming out to those kids as an atheist is, um, you know, kind of a scary thing to do. Like you might need to 
to fit in a little bit better and right. not straight up tell them that, you know, he thinks that all their beliefs are garbage. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that doesn't really describe him too well because he started going to uh, church with his grandmother like the last few months. And he hasn't told me about it at all, but his mom keeps telling me, she's like, he went to church again. <laughs> it seems like he's really into it. So I'm not, yeah, we'll see. This is tough. I no, this is like a he's tough probably, yeah, I feel like he's probably, you know, it's curious, you know, cause he hasn't really been around it his whole life like other people have. And, sure. um, and we want to give him the opportunity to figure things out for himself, you know? I can feel it, man. Yeah. I can feel the conflict. <laughs> I feel it bubbling up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's yeah. cool, man. You got to do it yourself. You got to figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's a, it's a really interesting climate for it now because it's relevant and not relevant. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. actually a part of the political process anymore where it used to be. You had to have that religious platform, mm -hmm. but like Obama and now this situation have both like removed that. Like you don't actually have to talk about it at all. You just got to try and like, if you're on the right, swing over and grab some evangelical votes or whatever. You got to pretend, you know, I mean. But you, they don't. But neither one of them did. I mean, Obama they, can't, claimed, they can't admit that they don't believe in God. Right. Even absolutely. I'm assuming they probably do because, I mean, most people do. But right. I don't, well, I don't think the politician can really get away with that. No, no, they, but they'll just, they'll puff it out there. But yeah, it's less prevalent than in the past two than it has been in other ones. I mean, elections were lost over like a lack of, a lack of attendance in the past. You know what I mean? Mm. So it becomes less, uh, it's weird. It, it's less important in one way, but it's more superficially important in the other. Just mm. the knee jerk to say it, you know, no, no basis, no charitable giving, no actual good deeds done in any yeah. capacity. But, you know, you just gotta, like you said, you gotta post it out there. Well, no, it's, it's tough when you're, you know, coming from a sort of atheist agnostic position and, and you don't really know what to say when something bad happens to somebody. Sure. You know, you don't, you can't really like feel comfortable saying, Hey man, like I'm praying for you. You know, so I know with words like, yeah, Best wishes. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for you, you know, like yeah. I, all I'm my thoughts about you. I'm thinking yeah. about you really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Cause I find yeah. myself in that same position. Cause like I have my own belief system and, uh, I, I'm so like, like multifaceted with it that when something happens, I, I just kind of think, well, this is what happens and any number of situations will come from it. And whichever <laughs> one of those happens, take it in stride and learn from it. Cause there's really nothing you can do. And, right. uh, you know, I don't want to, it's like a, the whole contrast between like two teams praying to win. It's like, what, yeah. so what? Like one is just ignored and the other <laughs> one is chosen. Like you get my, my good, my good wishes and you do not. So right. like, you happy and you sad. So yeah, it is uh, interesting. And uh, without having kids, I can just imagine that being a pretty interesting topic to have to deal with and not wanting to drive them in any one direction or the other. Right. But, uh, you know, trying to stay supportive regardless, regardless. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, Santa Claus is real, you know, in this house. Got it. Absolutely. Santa Claus. There's no doubt about that, but all the other stuff, eh, I don't know. Who knows? It's the thing that people think and believe and, you know, yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. We don't know. Sure. Um, but I, you know, since you happen to be born in, in this state, in this country, in this yep. area with, with these grandparents, then, yep. you know, you're basically like a Christian kid, <laughs> you know, but if you were born somewhere else, you'd, you'd probably be a, a different kind of religion, you know? Yeah. 4,200 recognized religions in the world. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. And I think that's, that's really what I want, you know, to convey to them is just, you know, it, it's a, it's important to, uh, to understand where people are coming from and, and, uh, you know, find a way to live in this world. Well, and I, bat and I battle, people, you know, well, I battle with that. The, um, the person, my great aunt who raised me never questioned her. Well, I'm sure she questioned her faith, but she lived in a, in a faithful way. And the, uh, the lessons that you do pick up from religions, that's not the only place you can pick up those lessons, but the, mm -hmm. the a lot of religions are the ones who teach those lessons out. 
outward. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like a lot of them are universally the same about be good and, you know, treat each other right and don't steal and rape and kill. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, fundamentalism comes in and they manipulate it and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of the positive lessons and actions are, are from that. Okay. So my friend Zaya, uh, the artist, uh, that's actually one of his right there. He made me that mask. He made um, you that. He did. Yeah. He did. And, uh, but he, you know, we're talking about uh, religion. <clears throat> he's from a Buddhist environment, right? So he's raised Buddhist. And um, he started coming to the country uh, as a Christian missionary in order to sell his paintings, not because he was a Christian or a missionary, but that's a very good way for Mongolians to come to the United States and go door to door and sell uh, the little mirror, or the things for the mirror on your car, the little thing that I'm sure has something to do with prayer or meditation or something, but yeah. you can, they have no explanation. They just knock and they're like, ah, I don't know what's going on. There's a bunch of Mongolians at my front door. But that's what he did in order to come over here and get a foothold in the United States and then sold art and did all the other stuff. He had a really interesting story that he told me about um, his view of religion because I was young. I was in my 20s and I met him and, uh, you know, I had the, the shop in Florida and uh, he was staying at my house and I had that American kind of like knee jerk thing that Buddhism is really good, right? Because it's like soul searching, it's, you know, it's beneficial, like you put out positive energy. These just, these very simple understandings that I thought I had of it. Uh, I know a little bit more about it now and I, I actually, like it's got some really good points to it. I really like some of the aspects of Buddhism. But when I talked to him about it, he said that the only religion that he's experienced in the world that does any good for anyone is Christianity. And I was like, but what about all the things that were done and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, people do bad things. He's like, but they're the only ones who go out on their own dime to everywhere in the world and feed people and take care of people and try and heal people and treat them well and go whenever there's a catastrophe. They're the only ones that goes in. He says, you don't see Buddha showing up at like hurricane relief and you, <laughs> you don't see stuff like that. And it was an interest. It was really kind of like interesting. He was like, "That's the perspective he took from it." Was that out of any of the ones that he saw, he felt they were the only ones doing good, and that was interesting because, yeah, well, I have my own views on it and the organized structures and all of that other stuff that we've talked about. Um, if it's just fundamentally on who's doing good for people, that's kind of really the only one that you can really hone in on. Now in other cultures, I mean, this is, this is a very, once again, very American perspective. I'm sure if I'm in another land and in another country, their own religious people are taking care of their own. But right. One of the things when I was, it was profound to me when I was a kid, I was 18 years old and I took off with two chicks. We drove across country. Um, the circumstances of which were just, you know, young idiots driving across the country and trying to figure out where you would end up. We ended up at Venice Beach and uh, we had a great time out there. I actually met some people in the industry that I still know today. Um, this was back in the 90s. Um, and I got out of my car with a group of us were going down to the beach and I got out of my car and there was these, this guy for no reason, maybe 50 years old, who just looked at all of us and he was walking into a house, his or not, and he just lost it. And he's like, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you people. You're never going to contribute to society. I don't know why you would look like that. You're never going to get jobs. You're never going to amount to shit and mm. blah, blah, blah. I mean, he just went the fuck mm. up for no reason. No just walking. And uh, I remember just looking over at him. And I mean, I had like a couple of crap tattoos. I had like blue hair, maybe some piercings. So we weren't even like the people that we know in the business that are like completely, you know, head to toe, anything. We weren't even extreme. And I just remember being like, well, fuck that guy. And that was like a huge motivation for me to accomplish anything or do anything in the business. Right. If there's going to be people like that, that already have that perception of people, then I want to go ahead and get them out of the way quick. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't want to be, I don't want to accidentally be friends with people like that. And then like find out they're assholes kind of like in today's political climate, like, Oh, I have more friends that are racist pieces of shit than I knew. Well, then <laughs> I, I got to go through and clean some of this out because yeah. everybody can be cool at the bar or at the show. But, you know, like these sort of things kind of expose more than what you think. Yeah. I think in your small circle, everybody has like some similar lines of thought, right? You feel yeah. like for whatever reason, you take that as like this, uh, you know, for granted. Yeah, you take it for granted. I always liked the idea that tattoos were a social filter, you know, just by, by having tattoos, there's going to be certain people that will not associate with you. 
hundred percent. And, you know, it, it just saves you the trouble of, of having to, uh, to deal with all the other things that come along with like turning your nose up at tattooed people. <laughs> I yeah. agree. Yeah. hundred percent. You told me one time that you didn't even know why you had tattoos. You're just like a normal guy. You could have been like, whatever <laughs> you got to work at like the hardware store, but just for some reason you were you know, <laughs> on the tattooing. Uh, and I always thought that was hilarious because it's true. Like, uh, Josh Ford told me one time, um, uh, we were talking about, remember a while back, uh, an artist was really got on a kick of tattooing everybody's face and tribal. He like, it was kind of like a phase where a whole bunch of people got tribal faces done all at once. I do recall that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little bit of a phase and you know, you're kind of yeah. like, you know, you wanted to support your friends, but you're kind of like, yeah, are you sure about this one? You know what I mean? And even <laughs> as being tattooed people, you know, when you make that transition, I mean, there it's consequential. Like there's, there's no question. You have to be responsible about whatever you do in life and just make sure that you're comfortable in your path. You know what I mean? Like sure. the enigma he's fine. He's a puzzle. He's, he's the enigma he's always going to be the enigma it's like he's he's balls deep but we were talking about that and you know josh he, who even has like you know the the mocha tattoo uh that's very subtle um mm -hmm. he said the difference between us and you know some of what was going on is we're just normal people that happen to like tattoos right there's another side where people are really trying to take it to that different extreme and have that different life experience and have it i um to find them and be a part of that. And that's great too. You know, we need characters, you need outlandish people, you need zombie boy and you know, shit like that. You, I feel like I'd much rather live in a world that has that opportunity that to look at than not. Right. I, I would hate a sterilized version of anything. And even in this industry, I mean, you know, there's standardized acceptable norms, even in this, you know what I mean? It's okay to have this or that, or express yourself in this or that way, or do this or that type of art, et cetera. Yeah, no, yeah, there's definitely, um, <laughs> it, it's funny how quick the, uh, the tattooed people who are, you know, supposed to be the ones who embrace individuality will, uh, will certainly like shame a person for, for being a different kind of individual. Quick. Really, really quickly. Very quickly. But I think a lot of that falls into, and not, not trying to blow you up here, but one of the things that's been impressive about your career is that you didn't find a niche and live in that niche for the rest of your life. Mm. And I'm not knocking that for some people. That's amazing. You know what I mean? You're trying to find your way in life. You find this, I can do this thing. I'm going to do that thing forever. Great. Awesome. Excel at it. Kill it. There's always going to be a market for it. There's something really to be said about somebody that can dedicate life to yeah. a particular trade and to a particular yeah. thing. And there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, if you're going to be a, wood carver and you know a knife maker or whatever you're gonna you can excel at that your whole life but you've like seemed to not ever really be held back by that you're like oh well, i'm gonna you know have a genre that i participate in and then maybe i'll participate in another or create one or or whatever and um with a lot of the forums and a lot of the um the things that i experienced in my time in the business uh was like you said people that are supposed to embrace this individuality they find their one particular niche of individuality and then that's it and nothing else goes like nothing else is acceptable it's like the amish when they decided that there was this one time period in the 1800s that had acceptable technology which was state-of-the-art and scientific <laughs> at the time you know right. what i mean and then they just stop and they're like no nothing further than these double axle <laughs> wagons with these harnesses and all of this shit you know what i mean oh, like, well. that is where we cut it off <laughs> and and it's the same thing like that was scientific advancement of its time you know and yeah. then they just like block in and it's because i don't know what that comes from i don't know if that comes from just um you know a fear of the next or the unknown or a, a concern that what they have been accepted as you know they can't break that They've got to hold on to that. They've got to stick with that one. Right. Yeah, They've exactly. It there. And it's not, like I said, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it is what it is. We all have our own path and we all have our own journey. So I'm not judging, but it is, I'm observing that there is a lot of hypocrisy in that and um, modified people like shitting on girls that get their eyebrows done or get mm -hmm. lip injections or get boob implants or something like that. And I'm like, bitch, you have your face tattooed. Like there's nothing <laughs> natural about you. And you're, you know, critiquing these people in this way. And it's, it's conflicting at times. And I understand that's why people get 
down and, you know, and, and worn thin. And I've been worn thin in, in the projects I've done uh, mm -hmm. throughout life because everything seems to be like when you start something, everybody's like real thumbs up. They're like, man, that's great. I'm so excited for you. And then all these people get around you and they're supportive, supportive, supportive. And then anything goes awry or if there's any reason to turn, I mean, they do it in a second. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? If it didn't meet some expectation of what they perceived you should be doing or how you should be doing it or whatever, nobody's there to help you start it. Nobody's there to help you think it up. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But after a certain period of time, everything seems to come back into this cycle where, okay, now it's time to turn on that person or that idea or that group. And uh, that's the, I think that's the disheartening thing. So I think that mixing it up like you do and taking example from people who never, never outwardly project the weight of that is like one of the uh, secrets to like continuing to go forward. You know what I mean? Because every, every project that seems to start eventually has like a turning point and some turning points happen right out of the gate like the thing that shall not be named but other things you know what i mean are like are like supported for a really long time and then turned on so yeah i think that's one of the uh i mean that's probably the same for anything in life whether it's relationships family city anything anywhere you are and anything you do there uh there will come those internal struggles where people just need to turn. They do it to stars, celebrities, teams. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I struggle with, um, you know, knowing what Russ Abbott, the tattooer, is supposed to do. You know, like it's, it's tough. Um, you know, I'm currently really interested in becoming more of a bodysuit tattooer. I have been for the last couple of years, and I've been taking steps towards that, and it's totally changed you know, the way that I act with my customers, um, you know, like, you know, I had a guy in the shop this week, he really just wanted his forearm tattooed. And, and I was pretty adamant that, you know, we needed to find a way to make it a full sleeve because, you know, why would you do anything smaller? Right. Than a full sleeve. Right. You know, it's, so it's, <laughs> You know, and I made it so much more difficult than it had to be. And at the end of it, he actually wasn't able to get tattooed that day. So I spent a whole day trying to figure out and you know, drawing on him with markers and trying to make his idea work. And it was, it was going to be, you know, in my head it was working, but in reality it wasn't working at all. And, um, you know, some days you just gotta, um, you know, accept that you don't have it and, and not just tattoo something on someone because they came to get tattooed. So, you know, that's a lesson that it took me a long time to learn, you know, but I've learned it now. You know, I don't, I don't just like stick something on someone that I'm not totally sure about. Right. Um, but I got away from the point of it. It was just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years into tattooing and I feel like I've got another 10 to 20 left to go. And it's important to me to, to, to plan to, uh, to do, you know, to, to end it right, you know, to, to finish off the last half of my career, you know, in control and, uh, and do something really epic with it. So I kind of feel like I'm at the end of one phase and the beginning of another and, and just sort of like gearing up and preparing to, to do something really rad, you know? And I think that in itself is the expectation and that's probably, mm -hmm. it, it probably has its own, its own significant pressure, whether or not it's for you. Cause I don't think you necessarily do it. I think you do it as much to impress yourself as you do anybody else. I don't think you're doing it just for that outward gratification. I think you want to sit back and truly be proud of it. Not just like, yeah make sure everybody else tells you that. But I mean, that's, that yeah, is no. Odd, man. no, I mean, it, it, when you, when you're working on large scale tattoos, um, there actually isn't as much, you know, positive feedback from social media, you know, right. like you're, you know, if, if you want to get, um, lots of likes and comments on an Instagram post, you know, do a tattoo this big and, and, and make it like really realistic. You no, know? absolutely. Or just uh, a <laughs> super, super finite, minuscule black, we just put a, like I saw one get circulated recently. It's a good tattoo. I'm not knocking it, but it's uh, the little plane, the little paper airplane and the <laughs> shadow under it is the yeah. bomber. Right. Devastating online. 
like going crazy and sat yeah. right next to like a bodysuit from three tides and it's like me eh, no. <laughs> whatever yeah. like whatever right. that is i can't even make sense of that and uh <laughs> and it it is weird it, it's interesting coming from my perspective as a as a uh you know, I would say previously a collector, I don't really get tattooed anymore, but <laughs> like I want, but um, as a collector and a, a shop owner and a business person in, in multi and multiple sides of it, like I have like an, uh, a desire to have the customers react well, but also to acknowledge that something amazing just happened and the customer needs to perceive that. So instead of forcing that, I found that the best way is just to engage with who you're dealing with at that time. Uh, a right. great lesson in my shop, one of the artists had, uh, he had two portfolios, one large, big portfolio, all big back pieces, all sleeves, all big work. And that was one portfolio. And the one that he sat beside it was the little four by six portfolio. Uh, we still took pictures back then and uh, yeah. had them develop. And uh, that portfolio was bangers. Mm -hmm. Cherry Creek, Tattoo Johnny, whatever the fuck, just banger bullshit, right? And that portfolio resonated with more customers than the large one. So the people would look at both portfolios, same artist, and say they wanted this guy. Yeah. Because he didn't have names on it, you know what I mean? So he said, I want this one. And he's like, that's how I hook them. You know, people can't grasp that back piece. They can't grasp that bodysuit. Not everybody can get that. But as a shop owner, you want, and as the, the artist I experienced, it was important to sometimes do that one because that is what they wanted and that's what they have budgeted and that's what they can conceptualize. And then from there, build, you know, and then a lot of these guys would get that customer as a permanent customer, you know, and they would think about what they were doing and where they were putting it that it could in the future be incorporated, you know? Cause that's like, the key. That's right. what you have to do. You know, even if the, you know, the customer comes in with no tattoos and their vision is to get something really big like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this huge piece. Right. Remember, you know, it, it, so I just try to, um, you know, have a conversation with them and, and force them to think about, you know, what do they know? What is the ultimate plan for their collection of tattoos? And, you know, sometimes one thing that happens a lot is people come in and they say, I want a half sleeve. And um, once you start to question them on why, you know, are they getting a full sleeve eventually? Right. And they'll say, well, yeah, I'm probably eventually. And, uh, you know, I say, well, you know, if you are, I'd like to know that because, um, I designed the tattoo differently knowing it's going to be a full sleeve. Right. And then once they accept that, you know, sometimes they'll just go ahead and agree to get the full sleeve, you know, sure. it's just, it's just a matter of having the conversation and, and, and seeing how far, far people are willing to go with their acceptance of things. And then there's the other customer that you have to take into consideration that might be a real collector that wants just memento pieces from their experience, their travels, the right. different artists that they want, you know, you have to take that into consideration. Yeah. Um, there was that phase when, uh, when, um, the color portraiture started becoming like a, a real thing and like everybody would just get this egg. I called them the Easter egg bodies yeah. and they would just get these heads mm -hmm. all over them with no yeah. rhyme or reason. And yeah. it would just, oh, they still do it. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to do it, that's great, but they would make it this definitive shape. And I was just like, mm. ah, what are you going to do? You know, like black yeah. it all out, like that one murdered sleeve. We all know what I'm talking about, where it's just <laughs> like three giant oversized, you know, brightly colored face and then just black with everything yeah. else. And it looks great in a photo from a distance. And then you see it in person. You're like, fuck, that sucks. Yeah, no. no, I think the key is for each artist that, that jumps in on that arm or leg to do the right thing and tie into the pieces around them, you know, right? right. not leaving customers with uh inch and a half wide gaps right you know, that they have to figure out later i mean it's you know it's it's on us to uh to respect the space that we're given you know and, the, and not just blast over a corner of the other tattoo for no reason just because right. you didn't yeah. want to lay it out right <laughs> yeah. uh one of the things that always like uh and I, i'm once again it's just outside perspective but a lot of the times that would happen with with some of the new school movement was that it would be a, you know, a smallish tattoo, clean, the subject matter was cool, it was done in a cool new school style. Um, and then just this, this need, this over, 
need to just put these blobs of color mm -hmm. around the back of it and it do the same thing like you took a tattoo that was yeah gay big and it could have like then gone on to the next thing but it just then you like tripled the size or at least doubled the size with just some filler <laughs> and it didn't it didn't make sense and then that had to be worked out later you know yeah. and it was like that same problem of just thinking about your piece at that time and not what that person was going to do with it down the road right. especially on like face and stuff like you just see these little face pieces done in the back background in the face piece and i'm like what are you doing and it just comes out like a bruise or like it looked like it bled out or you yeah. know they were trying to anticipate blowout or something like that but no, <laughs> i think that i think that's super responsible man and i think that that's that was something i we always tried to like carry in our shop was um you know we didn't do hands if you didn't have visible tattoos we didn't do forearms before top we didn't do necks if you didn't have something you weren't getting face and i think the only faces that were ever done in our shop was on tattoo artists you know i think yeah. i think that was it i don't think anybody else i i take that back there was this one crazy crazy son of a bitch i mean mentally unstable on meds on disability and everything and he had already gotten all this like crazy shit like norish stuff he really thought he was a viking and he got this stuff done all over and he already had like runes and crazy shit on his face so the artist like even asked like management is like are you okay with me just doing this guy it's fucking bad shit crazy and i think they just <laughs> continued on with the madness but right. other than that you know you had to like you, know, you got to pick your battles and you got to look at that shit down the road and you know if you care about it at all make the right choice if you don't whatever i always just look at the uh possibility that it's going to be me that has to figure out what's going to go next to whatever I do. And, um, you know, I, I, it's not about kicking the can down the road or making that someone else's problem. Like, sure. you know, I force people to think about it. Um, even if the customer doesn't care, you know, they're like, Oh, I'll figure it out later. I'm like, no, nah, I don't know. Like we kind of really need to know what we could do there. Even if we don't do it, it's nice to at least have an idea. So. Absolutely. Well, that was what was so cool about, um, you know, back in the day, lifted traditional, it was always like the dots and stars. That was a great way to fill in, you know, everything else. <laughs> but uh, with uh, when it came around to some of your styles, especially with the filigree and stuff like that, that became a way. Ah, to you said the F word. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. It's not uh, called or, or, ornamental. Sorry. It's called, no, it's called scroll work. Scroll work. Sorry. Yeah. I'm filigree so is, is not what I tattoo. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So what he said. Uh, yeah. But when you did that, like I have some on my hand and stuff, it became more of like the, the, the flow and the body itself as the art not needing to identify the object. And that was a whole different approach. Like it was always the object. You know what I mean? Somebody came in, I want a can of skull. Like that was what you did. And then anything else was just background or filler or whatever. And you kind of turned that around and did entire pieces that were yeah. just in what was previously decor. Basically, you yeah. tattooed kale. <laughs> like at the it's salad not too bar. far off man i mean no, it, no, it, it is it is it's 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 based on a leaf called acanthus um that you know it was used in uh ancient greek art and architecture and then got picked up by the romans and and pretty much everybody else has used the same leaf motif and over the centuries it's become more and more um you know kind of stretched and pulled and distorted until people don't even know they're looking at a leaf anymore and um you know it's it was on the dollar bill yep you know that's probably the first time i remember ever noticing it but it's definitely not called filigree by any other group of people other than tattooers and tattoo collectors and the people who have learned it from them yeah um it's you know in the uh, engraving world it's called scroll work mm -hmm. um in the carving world, it's called scroll work. To be uh, fair, I mean, literal literal representation is important. I mean, you want to say things accurately, but just like, you know, things happen over time, like Kleenex. Kleenex wasn't doesn't mean tissue paper, facial tissue. Uh, Kleenex is a name. And then right. after a certain period of time, a branding be moves over and takes over that name. Aspirin is the same way. Aspirin is not a pill. Aspirin is a family yeah. name. And sure. then it takes it over. So I appreciate your purism. Like, yeah. I really award that. I mean, it's, it's like shutters, purism. man. Shutters yeah. and, and scroll. <laughs> That's the problem today is shutters. Yeah. Shutters are the problem of the America today and calling your work filigree is the problem in the tattoo industry. But yeah. You, know, the day, I, you put on some fake ass shutters and you tattoo <laughs> badass leafy filigree. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's cool. I appreciate that lesson on that. That's always yeah, the more you know. More into that actually, and see the uh, the original 
the original leaf because I've been to Rome, you know, I've been to St. Mm -hmm. Peter's and, and the Vatican and seen all that amazing yeah. Baroque style. And where does, uh, cause the Baroque incorporates that a lot, correct? Right. But that, correct? that was, you know, centuries later. Sure. So, you know, in the, uh, in the Renaissance artists were, um, getting inspired by ancient Greek and ancient Rome, you know, Pompeii, the, the, uh, the, the city that was buried by a yeah. volcano had just been discovered and they were digging up all these ancient um, Roman pieces of art and shipping them back to London and Paris. And the artists there were seeing that stuff and they were getting stoked on it. Sure. And um, so it was working in um, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm I not, didn't know that. I didn't know that's when that, uh, that took mm -hmm. place. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a long distance called the middle ages in between, you know, the ancient world and the Renaissance. Yeah. And um, I, I think the stuff that the ornamental styles that I tattoo are mostly inspired by the Renaissance, but I'm, I'm trying to learn about all the different eras and all the different parts of the world. Oh, it's Cody. Hey, Cody. Well, that's, that's you want to talk to Cody. Sure. All right. Hey, Cody. Cody. He's like, nah. You want to be on the podcast with Chris? Yes. Okay. <laughs> How's it going, man? Good. How you been? Good. Yeah? Did you just get back from school? <laughs> I'm terrible at this. No. Oh, I'm not going to school today because I'm like my sick. Uh, the stomach virus. Uh, what happened yesterday with the stomach virus? I diarrheaed all over over my mommy's bed after room. Oh no! <laughs> I hope you're not contagious right now because you're really close to me. Yeah, you might do it right now. On you might diarrhea that. right now. <laughs> right on that. Yeah. Are you feeling better today, though, buddy? I might feel better tomorrow. There you go. Hope for the next day. Optimism, man. Yeah. Yeah. What do you got in your hand right there? What is that? Hold it up so we can see it. What is that? Is that a thumb drive? It's a computer chip. Computer chip? I think it's a USB thumb drive. And what's in your other hand? Oh, you dropped it. What is this? Who is that? They can't see it. Look. Who is that? Is this Blossom? It's bubbles. It's bubbles. Okay. Come on, man. Get it together. Cody likes the Powerpuff Girls. That's his favorite thing ever. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember that cartoon myself. Yeah, it's a good one. It is. So you're really not feeling good today, bud? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on the show with us. Appreciate it, buddy. I hope you feel better. Okay. Till next time. All right. Okay, say bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Diarrhea all over the bed. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I set him up for that. <laughs> <laughs> you cleaned it up though, right? No, I was at work, man. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> well, um, man, I appreciate this, the time. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that we can do it again because there's yeah. a lot of other topics I'd like to go over with you and uh, um, I just want to try and get back into the into the flow of uh, reconnecting with you, man. Like even if it's yeah, not on this, sure. you guys got to really check out the rest of Russ's projects. Give a shout out again to the sites that they can view your work and the shop's work. Sure. Um, online, we're inkanddaggertattoo.com, tattoosmart.com for the, uh, the digital design stuff. Um, Instagram, at Russ Abbott, at Tattoo Smart, at Ink and Dagger Tattoo. Very good. And now I got a call, of course, right there. Okay. I'm shut that off. Um, yeah. So maybe one time we come down there and even set up something local, man. Do it at uh, do it at the house. Do a little jam session. All right. Yeah. Let that go down. And uh, again, man, I appreciate it and look forward to talking to you. Yeah, soon. Thank you, Chris.